Thank you all for coming. Um, this is the first of our uh, Data Mondays. Um, uh, what I thought I would do today was give you a kind of general tour, set things up, maybe even walk you through a little bit of software. Um, and then between now and the next Monday, it would be most awesome if you could download two pieces of software for me. I'll give you their names at the end. Um, our Stabil, Stabil kids, where are you? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. So if you see one of these Stabil kids, they're all on a clot in the back. They've done it once. They've succeeded. You can follow them and succeed as well. Um, they're not difficult pieces of software to install. And the next time, we'll have a little bit more of a practicum, meaning uh, you guys will get a little dirty with data and start to ask questions, and we'll have more of a, of a discussion. Does that sound OK? Um, also, we're starting at 6.30. We're only going to go till 9.30, probably 9. I don't know. I start, to, I start to lose. You probably start to lose. There aren't enough cookies in the world that are going to keep you interested in data for three hours. So um, all right. So, uh, okay, so what we're going to do then is, um, uh, well, actually, before I start, are there any questions? Just lingering. Okay, good. So well behaved. There are seats up in the front, by the way. Y'all don't have to to play in the back if someone wants. Yes. Can you put the slides on the web? I will put them on the web. They're sort of on the web now, but just not a very visible part of the web. So, but yes, yes. Um, so yeah. So you don't have to take detailed notes. And in fact, what you'll find out is until we get to actual code samples, most of my slides are pictures. So it's, that's just sort of how it is. Okay. Yes. Uh, it would be nice if next time you had a laptop. How many of you, okay, um, uh, how many of you know someone that you can sit nearby that has a laptop? Okay, how many of you don't know anybody who you could at least sit nearby that has a laptop? A couple of them? Three? Seriously? Okay, good. So those of you who don't know anybody, wait, wait, raise your hand again if you don't know anybody who you can sit near. Okay, no, I mean, not tonight in general. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to ask delicate technological questions here, right? I mean, I had people in my class last year for whom the tablet was the only thing, and we had to make some adaptations to make sure they could compute on the tablet, but, but everybody pretty much has a laptop you can bring next time? Yes, yeah, so you don't need it for today. It would be kind of awesome, but not really all that necessary. But for next time, absolutely, okay? And we might even play up a little bit with the structure of the seats so you're not sitting so in a row, but maybe something a little more conversational, okay? All right, other questions? Um, oh, we have one of your TAs in the back. Can you say hi? Stan, say hi. <laughs> um, we have a second TA for you. <laughs> we have a second TA for you, and I'll tell you a little about all of that. Um, over the course of the next three weeks, uh, I'll be giving you little assignments. Um, Assignments, uh, right? Your voice goes up when you're more asking a question than really making a statement. I'll make assignments. Um, I have to say that last year, so, so I've only been in the J School for a year now, just over a year and a month. And um, uh, last year, last spring, I taught a class called Journalistic Computing. Um, and one thing that the students asked for that I tried to deliver on, but meh, but now I have a backlog of them. Um, they wanted little drills, right? Little things to keep them going and get them exercised, right? Because with your writing exercises, drills are going to be important, right? You get to know your craft by doing it. And the same thing here. You'll get to know how to interact with data by doing it. Um, all right, so uh, other, other questions? OK, so we're just going to start. Um, so what I thought I would do is, um, is give you just a tiny bit of background about how I think about data probably six or seven slides that might help frame where I'm coming from and why, well, I think it'll just explain a whole lot. <laughs> um, so uh, my doctorate's in statistics. I went to Berkeley more years ago than you guys have been on the earth, perhaps not collectively, but at least individually, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and have come to appreciate, for lack of a better term, the human side of data. And so a lot of what I'm going to be, a lot of what I think you all are going to be using when it comes time to writing stories and incorporating your reporting is making that connection between the humanness of your story, the subject, the political inequality, the whatever it is, and the data that it represents, right? Not to dehumanize things into a pixel, dehumanize things into a number, but retain, have, have data retain its essential humanness, right? Um, and we're gonna come back to that 
repeatedly. Um, so let me give you, a, about uh, a year and a half ago, I was asked to be on a panel at the New York Public Library about what makes a good data visualization, which is sort of an a interesting sort of notion to start with. And we were supposed to come in with five of our favorite data visualizations. And inevitably, the other four members of the panel all came in with five of their own data visualizations. <laughs> I thought, well, wow, OK. Um, but I came up with five of other people. So I want to give you a sense of what data are and how they can be represented and how they can tell stories in different ways. So just to give you some framing for where we're headed. Um, the first piece, and the Stabil students saw this already last week, is something called The Million Dollar Blocks by Laura Kurgan. Today, actually, the stop and frisk decision came down. Did we all hear about this? Yes. Yes, right? So we're going to talk, we're going to look a little bit at the stop and frisk data, actually, toward the end of the, end of this, end of the uh, lecture. Um, but under the, under the, uh, under the heading of, of sort of crime and data, um, Laura Kurgan worked with um, a, uh, uh, a research lab that focused on um, social justice issues. Um, and her project initiated or started with the idea that when Google Maps first came out, right, the one, inevitably the first things that went on a map were crime incidents, right? So people putting crime reports up on maps. That was the, inevitably the first Google Maps mashup that happened in any community. And in some sense, they're not the most actionable of things, right? People who live in the community often know where the, the crime is occurring. Um, it, it can sort of spread stereotypes about an area. It can, it can it's, it's not the most, it's, as, as a piece of policy, maybe it's not the most, um, the most positive thing to do. Um, certainly, there are lots of, of pieces of data theater, like Comstat. I have, um, how many of you know what Comstat is? Right, so it's, the, it's, a, it's, again, a piece of data theater that the New York Police Department actually taught a class at UCLA a few years ago where we attended a, comp, a CompStat meeting. Um, you know, they're held in a hotel ballroom. There's a U-shaped table. All the precinct members, the heads are around the table. The chief is at the end. There's a screen. There's a map. Each chief gets up. Each precinct head gets up, and there's all the crime that occurred on, in their precinct. And the chief says, why did that happen? What's going on there? Why is that happening? And in that situation, that little piece of theater is kind of amazing. And my students, I think, for the first time, spent time in a room where they were the only ones not carrying a gun. <laughs> so, um, but Laura decided that, Laura Kurgan, who's actually on faculty here in the, um, in the School of Architecture, um, decided that maybe crime maps aren't the most sophisticated way to get at sort of the origins of crime and what's going on. So instead, she asked for a data set, or after it was hard fought, um, for a data set that um, uh, 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 was offered by the um, New York State Corrections Department, where um, uh, for every inmate, she, uh, she had their address, their home address, and how much money the state was spending to keep that person in prison for a year. Okay, so address and the amount of money to keep them in prison for a year. She then accumulated that money per block and pushed it back on a map of New York. Um, here, the redder the squares, the more money that's being spent. Um, and what she found is that there are certain blocks in New York where the state is paying more than a million dollars to keep residents who live on that block in prison. And so, and that's just one city block, right? So you can think to yourself, if I'm gonna spend a million dollars to try to improve something going on in, in, in a particular area, there's gotta be better ways to do it than just transporting people into jail, right? There, it's a, it becomes an actual policy statement, right? Something that we can, we can, in effect, she flips the question. She flips the data and puts it on the map, as opposed to doing the primary thing. And that, to me, is one of, again, is one, I think my favorite data visualization. Um, the next, and we're going through five of these, is something called Nuage Vert. It's, um, it's uh, not a screen-based data visualization, but um, it's a projection, a laser projection, onto the smokestack, or the smoke coming out of a smokestack from an electrical power plant. And this is in Helsinki, I think. Um, they launched it in Helsinki and Paris and various other cities. Um, the size of the green cloud gets larger with the larger amount of, of, um, of activity in the, um, in the electrical plant. So when we're burning a lot of electricity, huge green cloud. When we're saving a lot, small green cloud. It becomes a very legible sort of beacon of kind of the data behind the, 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 the creation of or the generation of electricity. It's kind of an awesome project, right? And it, what it, it also does is it gets you off the screen. 
It gets you, stops you from thinking that data have to live purely on a screen, but that there can be data uh, representations, data visualizations, and experiences around data that are much more than just something that happens on your laptop. Okay. Um, this is another picture of it. Is that the level of emissions or the amount of um, energy being produced? Um, it's actually, I think it's 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 the amount of energy being. I'm sorry. It's it's the amount of em so whichever one is measurable and they can be correlated. So um, uh, I think the amount of, yeah, I think it's the amount of emissions because that can be measured locally off the smoke center. Um, the next project is from Natalie Jaramajenko. She was on faculty at NYU. This is called the One Trees Project. It again is data visualization, but now is completely analog data. Um, here in this, in this project, she took um, um, uh, identically uh, genetically identical trees and planted them in different parts of the Bay Area and just came back after a couple of years to see what happened to them. And what you see, in effect, is um, conditions where the trees are happy, conditions where the trees are neglected, conditions where the trees are sort of like, like barely holding on, right? Um, and again, this is now not us going out and collecting, let's say, um, air quality measurements from around the tree, collecting the amount of rainfall, collecting a lot of sort of hard digital data, but instead, there's this sort of analog signal, the status of this tree as a, as a representation. Okay. Again, it's a, to me, this feels like a fairly powerful kind of storytelling. Um, the, the, the next one is, uh, comes from the New York Times uh, Research and Development Lab. How many of you knew the New York Times had a research and development lab? A few of you. It's an absolutely awesome place. And if you have any time, we should take a trek up there and go visit. Um, they're doing some amazing work, like this piece of data visualization. Um, it's a magic mirror, meaning there's a, a mirror in the front and a video screen in the back. And you can, every day during that come to Jesus moment when you face the mirror for the first time, have displayed in front of you all the statistics of your previous day, your previous week, your previous month. How much did you exercise? How much did you sleep? What was your sleep like? You can think of all those sensors that, that are coming about because of the quantify itself. Um, have we heard of that movement, like attempts to sort of take data about yourself, about your movements, and representing them here in the morning mirror, right? It's kind of a fascinating, a fascinating um, moment. There's also voice recognition and various other things. And of course, it's times branded, which means that your favorite, uh, what it thinks your news articles of the day might be interesting will splash in front of you after, maybe to, to buoy you after you've realized you've gained five pounds because of the cheesecake that's been well documented that you had the night before. Um, all right, uh, and I'll skip over these. Um, maybe just, just one note. Um, I've also had a bear, fair bit of experience with data visualization. Um, my collaborators and I uh, uh, made the piece that's in the lobby of the New York Times building. It's uh, 520 uh, small, 560 small text displays. Um, the data we get are a feed of all the uh, news stories uh, uh, happening uh, or being written about in the Times blog posts, stories, user comments. We get a 10%, oh sorry, 1% sample of the, uh, of the, of the uh, access logs, the web access logs, and we get a sample of the search terms. Um, and then we play these out on these screens where the screens take on different pieces of text. Um, we've done something similar outside the um, uh, communications building at the uh, University of Texas at Austin on their campus. In this case, however, um, the, the text, instead of being inside the building, are projected on the outside of this eight-story building. Um, and again, it's a sort of a live feed of, of in this case, local news. Um, and then finally, a piece that we did for the New York Public, or sorry, the, the Public Theater down uh, on Lafayette. Um, it's a large chandelier. Uh, this case, the data doesn't have anything to do with news, doesn't have anything to do with live. The data are just Shakespeare, Shakespeare plays. Um, there are 37 plays, which means this poor bladed thing had to have 37 things equally arranged around them. And from the standpoint of an architectural question, where you want to put four mount points, but the 37 doesn't quite, like 37 is the worst number, because it doesn't go <laughs> in evenly. Like if there were only 36 plays, it would have been great. Like we're thinking, oh, come on, you know, like, uh, for this in Cressida, that's not really that important. Could we get rid of it? <laughs> like, didn't really like Virgin of Venice. Like, or if it was 38, it would be awesome, right? Could we promote one of the one of the lost pieces and get a different set? 
Um, and then here again, like I said, we're taking text and we're doing a kind of anaphora mining where we're looking at the rhetorical structures that Shakespeare uses and, and using those in this kind of data visualization. So the world that I wanted to portray for you with those few examples is one where data are active, data presentation and interpretation can be a source of both entertainment as well as strong storytelling. Um, data don't have to live on a screen, they can be out in the world um, and can have powerful effects. Right? Um, so while many of us might think of data as something like this, right, sort of ta long tables of numbers, which it undoubtedly at some basic core level uh, end up having to be, it has to be represented for a computer to do something <coughs> with, but that at a conceptual level it can be so much more. Um, so while many of us think of data for better or for worse, as Excel spreadsheets with all of the lovely graphics that come along with them. Um, uh, and I tell you, we will not be learning very much. How many of you know Excel? Raise your hand up high and proud. <laughs> okay, great. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on Excel then. Um, well, we have other things in, in store for you. Um, and in fact, it goes beyond just what we think about as the frame of data, we, you know, thinking about data as that chunk, that rectangle. Um, it goes back even to the, it, it goes sort of conceptually even to how we, how, we, what, how, how, how people have chosen to define data and what it might represent. Um, there are a lot of definitions out there that are things like uh, what Google will be happy to, to cough up for you, like data are facts and statistics. Oh, facts. Um, data are uh, quantities, characters, or symbols, which can be manipulated by a computer. Well, maybe, I don't know. And you can go on and on. So data collection of facts, measurements of observations that are collected as sources of information. Um, there's a couple sort of righteous sort of sources out there, like uh, data is anything but raw, right? That, that in fact, data is not really a natural resource. You, you often can read now in the, in the big data literature that like data is the new oil. There's nothing sort of naturally resourcey about it. Data is a human product um, uh, and a cultural one that um, sort of needs to be generated, protected, interpreted. Um, uh, datas are no data are numbers in context. That's the one I had to keep teaching from at UCLA. Data are numbers in context. <laughs> it's a big, very, um, I'm sort of more amused by data being political. Um, then there's some chatter about what makes data big. Maybe it's large size. Um, so, right, so big, big. Um, also data are getting, uh, as, a, as a practical matter, um, for your reporting practices, data are gonna become a more and more important part of what you do. The profession, like it or not, is becoming more empirical, which means that you're gonna be forced to, not forced to, <laughs> encouraged to, led giggling down the path toward um, <laughs> looking at data, right, and having something to do with data. Um, institutions, governments, um, are increasingly equating transparency with, with data publication, and we'll talk about that political act of publicizing data. Um, but for example, the New York City Open Data Portal um, provides for you um, a, a, a wealth of, of data that are sort of mandated by the city to be made public. Um, uh, uh, if you have a look at what's getting downloaded the most, they tend to be things like uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, maybe the medallion, uh, taxi driver's medallions, like, oh darn, KL557, I'm gonna get you, right? Um, uh, subway entrances, the 311 uh, service responses, those, that, that data set's always good. You get people calling up going, my neighbor's loud, the pigeons are driving me crazy, that, that's usually a good quality of life thing. Jobs, the uh, restaurant inspection results are kind of cool, um, although it depends on, well, it depends on where you eat. Um, uh, uh, building footprints and so on. Uh, if you work up the chain, the New York State uh, also has, a, has a, an active program of making data available. Um, everything from uh, uh, New York's top fishing spots uh, to uh, the MTA data, so you can get all the historical uh, turnstile entrances and exits off the MTA. Um, I think going back to like 1910 or something, so you can look at ridership over an incredible period of time. Um, uh, farmers markets near you and a range of other other things are all available. Um, and if you go up to the federal government, you get, of course, data.gov, right, which is trying to make, um, well, of course, you can see the production values of these sites get better and better the higher up you go in the food chain, right? So here we have these 
lovely Aryan baby smiling at us. And, and, um, uh, uh, so you get data from the federal side, everything from, from sort of net the national bridge inventory, I want to find something to do with that, um, to credit card complaints, to uh, service health service providers. So data are being sort of increasingly put out there right, by organizations. And one, you may ask, and it's legit to say, well, if people are putting it out there, maybe there's nothing to find. Right? Maybe there's nothing there at all. Right? That was a topic that came up in my class. Right? If someone put it out there, you know. But the beautiful thing about data is that sort of unintended consequences of a data release. First of all, it's usually the surprising things usually never come from the first order data itself. It always comes or usually comes from the secondary uses of data. Someone takes the data for which it was not meant to be used and puts it to a different application or combines it with another data set. Right? Data. I was trying to write down the rules of data, and somehow rule four is data are promiscuous, right? They love to combine with other data. Right? And once that happens, amazing new things happen, right? Um, okay, so, uh, uh, and actually among the, what, what, what's interesting too is that once you take on sort of the mantle of sort of, um, I'm going to be sort of a righteous journalist that uses data as part of my practice, um, you are almost implicitly, or um, you, you, you take on also um, the, the responsibility of helping to advocate for open data, helping to advocate for keeping it open. And that's one thing, actually, not that this little spiel right now is a kind of mea culpa about my last class, but one thing I left out of my last class, we were thinking about all the tools and all the techniques and all the ways we can visualize data and all the important things, advocacy was missing. Right? And advocacy is something I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, I'm in school of journalism, why didn't I think of that? But there should be an active advocacy program on the part of open data, <coughs> keeping data open, keeping data free to free people to use. And um, an example of this is um, something that just recently came out from the, um, from the uh, 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 again, on the New York City uh, open data site. Uh, there was a resistance to let a, a particular data set go called Pluto. Um, Pluto is a, basically a, 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 a a uh, description of every single structure uh, in New York City, right? So the building that you're living in, the dorm you're living in, the, the, the brownstone you're living in, my apartment building, its footprint is somewhere in this data set, okay? Along with a lot of other, uh, a lot of other information about how many floors the unit has, what kind of air rights it has, because in New York it's all about the air rights, um, what it's, its taxes are. These data, in fact, were primarily aimed at taxes, right, and looking at, at collecting taxes. And so the city had to keep track of when a building was built, what the footprint was like, how many, how many stories, and so on, um, for taxes and zoning purposes. Um, the city didn't want to get let it go, and yet people like our own New York world advocated on the part of the city's own rule that all data have to become public, right? Data that, that we own have to become public. Um, because previously it was for fee, $1,500 to get this data set. It was usually outside the reach of most people. Um, and so they managed to get it released, and then you get sort of, haha, beautiful things that happen. So these are the examples of the kinds of data um, uh, uh, so there are information on over 800,000 structures in Manhattan, and you can start to sort of dig into it spatially, like looking at all of the spaces that are owned by New York City itself, right? or finding um, all of the area owned by NYU, or all of the area owned by Columbia. It turns out, actually, that Columbia is the third largest property owner in the city. The city itself is one, the Catholic Church is two, and Columbia is three. <laughs> My U is like fifth or seventh. I've heard it various, computed in various ways. Um, you can also look at, well, where are the places where you have to walk up, right? And how many flights do you have to walk up? Um, uh, and uh, this particular search of the data set finds that there's apparently a dozen, a dozen buildings in the city that have more than 10 floors you have to walk up. <coughs> You're going to have calves of steel going up those every day. Um, all right, so, so um, and then this particular site goes on to, um, this is uh, Andrew Hill's site, uh, who runs something called CarterDB, and we'll learn a lot more about CarterDB in the third of these lectures. It's a mapping tool. Um, but from this, you can start to ask questions, well, 
how far, find for me areas or make a map of, you know, house by house about the distance to the nearest public park or to the nearest public land. And you can start to ask questions about the conditions of people and their living conditions, right, um, simply by knowing where the structures are and how many units are in them. Right? So you can, again, a secondary use of that data starts applying or allowing you to ask different questions. Um, and this is all to say that um, increasingly the data that we're called to look at isn't really just about that Excel table spreadsheet thing anymore, but that there are many other kinds of data out there to be looked at and to, 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 be, to, be, to be analyzed. Um, so let me give you a couple of um, perhaps uh, uh, data uh, definitions that might, um, that might be a little bit more empowering than just data are numbers in context, <laughs> right? Because with that kind of definition, what you end up doing is thinking, if I need some data or I need to solve a problem, what I'm going to do is go down to the library or I'm going to Google something, I'm going to find a data set, I'm going to load it into Excel and away I go, right? But that in fact, there's a much larger practice that you, should, you could be thinking about. Um, the first reference um, uh, comes uh, or the first couple of references come to the, uh, uh, try to strike at the idea that data are maybe more like a verb than a noun, right? Um, whether it's a plural noun or a singular noun, that's up to you, but that maybe data are more like a verb rather than a noun. And Joanna Drucker, uh, a, uh, a, uh, in the Information Studies Department at UCLA, likes to contrast data, which in Latin means what is given, with capta which in Latin means what is taken, and thinks that what we really should be talking about when we talk about data is capta, something that we're taking from people, right? that we're taking from the world, that there's an active process of us taking something, of us observing something, of us coming away with something, right? and that that's maybe, that implicates us in our actions and what we do a little bit more than just it's what's given. It also defines the framing to say that by taking, we are taking specific things in specific ways. We are choosing, for example, when it comes to thinking about maybe air pollution, we're choosing to measure certain kinds of things in certain kinds of places. We're making choices. It's not that it's just sort of given to us in some sense, but that, but that, uh, that data always, or if we were to take her term, CAPTA always involve making choices. Um, and actually, goes, she goes a little farther, and there's, there's a reference to an article here. And again, all this stuff is going to go up on the web, so you don't have to write much down. But um, uh, she goes on to describe how this might impact data visualization. The idea that in scientific visualization, when we make plots, we often think of some phenomena, like measurement of something on the y-axis, so pollution or stock prices. And then on the x-axis, we have time. And it's always just clock time. But as a as a, as a professor in the humanities, she's concerned about other notions of time. Maybe time that loops back on itself, time that gets ruptured because of some incident. Right? Our perception of time changes, and how can you use perceived time on an axis instead of chronological time? It's a good face, I like it, but it's <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, and then ditto for space, right? Maybe the presence of something or the absence of something can warp space, so that we should stop and think before we put, just by definition, put things on a map or think because data feel like they're spatial, that they belong on a map, that there are other framings that might be useful. Um, and her example of this, um, or her, one of her examples of this comes from a fairly famous uh, data visualization. And I, I promised myself since after the first year of graduate school that I would never use this example just because it's the example that I got 25 times in the first year of graduate school. So, you all will probably in your reporting classes or across your first year get like 20, like one example 25 times. I don't know if it's the Pentagon paper, I don't know what it is, but something's gonna keep coming back at you. And for me, it was this picture. And this is London and each dot is someone who died of cholera. Um, and this is sort of famously Jon Snow's attempt to figure out um, where cholera is coming from. Um, and he sort of made a, he put sort of each dot as a person who, who died from cholera um, and found that there was sort of a gap um, in, the, in the deaths um, that, that, that people who were dying were clustered around um, certain pumps, certain wells um, that were uh, uh, drawing from the Thames and some of those were polluted with cholera and so people who drank from those wells ended up getting sick. 
there was another well that 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 wasn't um, that wasn't uh, polluted, and he used that as a kind of natural experiment to to recognize that the, you know sort of one source of water was okay and the other wasn't, and that Kahlo was waterborne and so on. Um, but in, in in sort of looking at this kind of famous data visualization, um, what what strikes you about this? So you have like a map of London, and each dot is someone who passed away. What strikes you about this? Right, so we can look at this as pattern. It's concentrated in the center. Like I said, it's gonna be clustered because there are pumps that serve certain neighborhoods, and some of those pumps are serving up contaminated water and some are others. What about just more at a, at a, at a human level, right? What, what's, go ahead. Just the fact that it's all hand drawn, and so exact. Right. right, so it's 1800 something, and John, very careful man. I, I think what I responded to when I saw this, and I still respond to a little, yes? I wonder if some of the people who are far from what seems to be the obviously contaminated pump commute and work in that area. Could be, right, travel. or have, have family, or have family attended to those family nearby. When people get sick, you go to tend to them, and, and because of the way color works, you, you could end up getting sick as well. Um, so Joanna Drucker uses this example, not so much because of the precision and the remarkable, the remarkable idea of putting things on a map, which for, for John Snow's time was like incredible, right, to, to do this. And people you know, pointed as one of the, to it as one of the first examples of epidemiological study. Um, but that in this case, each dot represents a person, and there's nothing more in the data set about that person, right? And that it's simply a, a death, and her, her her reworking of that picture, I know it's a little overwrought and it's a little dramatic, um, but would be, the, the, maybe the humanist perspective according to Drucker would be to have a little bit more concentration on the conditions of the people who were living through that situation, right? So when we're telling that story, not simply a story of Jon Snow and, the, and finding a pump, but in addition the kind of people who were involved in it, the, the putting it back into human terms. And we'll see that again and again when you look at da digital data. And this, of course, is not digital, but when you look, because it was all sort of hand-drawn, but when you look at digital data, whether it's, it's um, data on, well, we'll see another example in a second. There are, the, the count, it's easy to, to let it get away from you that, that, the, that the numbers represent something in human terms, right? And to keep coming back to that, it somehow expressed that. Um, there's a second, uh, second definition that comes from epidemiology. So Joanna Drucker was one view on data. Um, John Trossel has a lovely book on epidemiology, epidemiology and culture where he describes data collection as a process of social exchange. Right? When you go out and survey someone, when you go out and talk to someone, there is a process of social exchange going on, that you are taking from them, you are giving something back, there are motivations and incentives for them to participate and talk to you. You have your own motivations and incentives to talk to them, but to always be aware of the fact that when you collect data in your work, even if you're accessing data off an anonymous database somewhere, you are engaged in some kind of social exchange. Um, all right, so then, what in the end, this is pretty belaboring the point, but what, what, are, what are data? Well, as I'm trying to get at, data is maybe more verb than noun, that there are politics and social questions around data collection, that data is a very active process. And that, especially what I've seen from the reporting process, data rarely start, starts and rarely, sorry, data rarely ends with just a single data set. It's not just a single Excel spreadsheet, but it's this, and then what this has to say, and then this one to corroborate, and then what this other person says. And it's not so far, very far away from your standard journalism pra journalistic practice, where you don't just depend on, you know, at all times on one source, but you talk to others, you corroborate, right? And the process of interviewing data is very similar to the process of sort of interviewing people, uh, except that the language may be a little different. Um, so, in an attempt to try to get even a little bit hairier in terms of what data were, I, I had a, 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 when I first joined UCLA, I hadn't taught before, um, and so I was forced to get up in front of a room full of about 300 undergraduates and talk to them about introductory statistics, and oh boy, that was not a, not a pleasant first lecture. Um, but. Uh, because I found that the, the, that the student's conception of data, and in fact the book that I was forced to use, its conception of data was so reductive, it was hard to find any joy in it. 
So I found myself instead seeking other disciplines where there might be joy at the core of their discipline. So the library scientists or the, the people who work with documents, how do they define a document? Right? Information studies, how do they define information? There's gotta be something more exciting at the core of those disciplines than my statistics data or numbers in context. Right? There has to be something more exciting. So I found a beautiful example in the mid 20th century French documentalist movement, and you didn't think you'd hear about the French documentalist movement coming this evening, did you? Um, but the idea that, that in the 30s, that somehow a document wasn't just a piece of paper or a mimeograph or anything that you would find in a card catalog, but that a, a document could be sort of any source of information, perhaps even in material form, um, that could be used for reference or for study. And in a famous example, Suzanne Bright um, called, declared a document any physical or symbolic sign um, and is sort of famous for having declared living things, objects, planets, data, right, documents. Um, her idea actually being quite journalistic, um, the, this is a description of, um, yeah, and I sort of like putting up large wallpapers of text, I apologize for that. Um, this is an example of, uh, of, of what she means by how sort of data documents beget more documents as you ro run over time. So she starts with the discovery of an antelope, um, like a new species of antelope. And they bring it back to a zoo. Um, its pictures are taken of the antelope. There's a recording of its a little antelope cry. There's measurements of its little antelope hooves, right? There's like, you know, lots and lots of data that come off of it. Um, uh, there are news reports about the antelope and its arrival. Um, maybe at some point it dies and it gets stuffed and the stuffed thing now sits in a natural history museum somewhere as a thing. But all of these transformations are simply transformations on the originary object which you can think of somehow as a kind of source of data. And everything that comes off of it is just sort of measurements that we choose to take. Back to the capped idea. Um, so the cataloged antelope is an initial document and all the other documents are secondary or derived. And I thought, what an amazing thing. At the core of what library science, and I thought the librarians were the only discipline more boring than statisticians. <laughs> There's like this antelope trotting through in the middle of it. It's fantastic. Um, sorry, that's just, that's for, right? Um, all right, so, all right, so, so that's, that's, uh, Maybe that's all we have to say about, about the definition of data. We'll just take it to be patterns in the world, whether it's mental, physical, or virtual. And, and you as journalists, you as people who will be telling stories in the world, data will represent ways to, or data will be for you ways to represent the world, ways to represent it um, primarily quantitatively, okay? Um, are there any questions for that so far? I know it's a little rambly and a little like, <laughs> yes. Um, Pluto, I, I'm sure every, so again, Pluto was designed for taxation purposes. My guess is that any city has to know something of what's on each of the blocks and must have some, now I don't know if someone's gone to the trouble of actually outlining the footprints, that's a whole other thing. Um, uh, so you'd have to check with the municipality. I don't know that this is, this is a, my understanding is this is a fairly special thing. I mean, it's a huge data set, but um, are there other questions? Yes. Um, so let's say it's regarding New York City, New York State, and the federal government. Are those all raw data sets? Or and how do we use those? Right. So we'll talk a little bit about, about how we get data how we, in, a, in a few slides, about how we know we're in the presence of data, what data look like, and since it could be an antelope, what they smell like, and then <laughs> maybe feel like, right? Anyway, so we'll get a sense of, because of, where I want to head now is, um, is to talk about about um, about sort of how you know you're looking at something that you can compute with, or you can work with, or you can manipulate. Okay. Yes. I'm curious, if we're going to get into all, like if the act of quantifying something changes data. Yeah. I don't know if that's too meta. Um. So, so I would love to talk with you at length about that. So, so um, the. Uh, so for those of you who really get excited, there is a, a new institute for data sciences and engineering here on the Columbia campus. 
And part of what it's studying is sort of data science. Right? Now, what is, it, what, is it, what is the science of data? Well, it's partially mathematical, meaning it's partially um, about computer science, partially about statistics, but it's also part social science. What does it mean to count? What is the implication of being counted? Right? What does it mean to, 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 have, to have something observed and then an, in, an inevitable inequality recognized? Right? That's a very basic thing that you could study and talk about. Are there other questions? Okay, so next we're gonna spend a little time talking about data and or as journalism. Um, so I, I was promising you a few rules as we go along. The first that I've tried to emphasize already is that all data are human. They depend on human observation, human memory, human uh, uh, intervention, human activity um, to record a data set. Without humans, there are no data. Okay? Um, and, and, it's, and because of that then, they inherit all of our biases, they inherit all of our blind spots. So just because you think someone says the you know, whatever, whatever proportion is 52%, or the percentage is 52%, doesn't mean that the story stops there, right? Numbers have on, as, only as much authority as the person who collected them, okay? Um, so when thinking about and talking to and interviewing a data set, recognizing that it's human, what you're really doing is talking to data about the incentives and motivations of the people who collected it, where did it come from? Has it been used before? How does it relate to other data sets? There are a series of questions that you might ask that we'll get to. Um, the corollary to this is that because all data are human, there's necessarily a gap between data and lived experience. Data will not always describe what's on the ground. This, the re investigative reporting, or the reporting class that I'm part of, our beats are about poverty. Right? And there are lots and lots of different ways to try to characterize poverty but there is inevitably a gap between what we measure, that is your income is above or below the poverty line, and the actual experience of, of, of being poor, right? of being in a city where you're surrounded by, well, being in a city like New York, right? Um, so so that, that fundamental experience is not capturable by data. You could take a swing at it, you could try to describe it, but there's a gap. And my feeling, at least based on the entire year and a month of my experience, is that gap is where journalism jumps in. Okay? That journalism is the thing that's filling the gap between lived experience and, um, and sort of data. Um, so here's an example. This is from a project that I worked on. Um, as a statistician, you tend to do absolutely no work of your own, but you're a helper monkey. So I was helper monkey on a project where we were looking at um, sort of large scale data visualization, and I, I might show some of it next time, where we were looking at um, uh, global migration, people moving from one part of the world to another, from one country to another. Um, and we were looking at people moving for, um, for, uh, 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 for uh, economic reasons, right? It's just more, you can get a job overseas or over, across the border, whereas you can't get one at home. Maybe for political reasons, uh, so sort of refugees, um, maybe for environmental reasons, right? Sea level rise, every millimeter or centimeter of sea level rise is displacing a million people, right? So people moving. And so one of the statistics we looked at, or a set of statistics from the United Nations, was uh, people leaving countries because of, of um, so refugee, so, so refugee, the, the refugee process, people leaving their country for political reasons. And this was one of the very first tables we got from the United Nations describing people leaving these various countries, Colombia, Iraq, Uganda. This was 2006. What can you tell me about these numbers? Yes? I would say that definitely two of them, probably all of them, are estimates. But Colombia and Somalia definitely are estimates. And right. the other ones, I mean, they're looking back, but we don't know who collected them. Uh, probably didn't collect them in any place. That's exactly right. I, I looked that that Columbia, those that those six zeros were heartbreaking, right? It means a kind of collapse to the system. It means that there's so many people coming across and so little infrastructure to count that we just can't, <coughs> right? There is no, there is no, there's, there's nothing there to support that. Um, same for, uh, for Somalia. Um, and you're right, the others seem eerily precise and yet 
my guess is that the on-the-ground on situation doesn't warrant that level of precision. But one thing you'll find from the United Nations, and one thing you'll find in general from most data sets that you pick up like this, is there is no assessment of uncertainty, right? So that 400,000, could it be 500,000 or uh, 100, you know, or, or, um, or you know, 900,000, or could it be 50,000, right? What, what is the range? How much of a guess is it, right? You typically don't get that sort of thing with these, with these sorts of statistics. Were there other things people saw from here? Yes, in the back. Right, that's right. So this is something we're going to come up against sort of when we talk next time a little bit about how you write with data, that there is sometimes the absolute number is shocking enough, three million people maybe doesn't need to have a denominator attached to it. Um, or sometimes the shocking thing is that this number, even if it's um, only 200,000, represents three quarters of the country, right? That, that, that there's, a, there's different ways of expressing that. Um, all right, and again, this goes back to the idea that when you see tables like this, all of these tables that come from the UN or NGOs, or when you start studying these larger, even sort of government, um, even sort of U.S. government statistics, they're all, cre you know, they're all collected by humans, and the amount of effort, the amount of resources to do that carefully, uh, uh, can vary considerably. Um, so the first step, step, step of any data analysis, um, which is something that we tend not to talk about in statistics, it's just because it doesn't mathematize very well, it's hard to put a delta and an epsilon around this, but the very first step of any data analysis um, exercise is deciding what to measure and um, how to represent it for computation. So what am I going to measure? Like I have something like, as an example in our reporting class, poverty. How am I going to choose to measure it? Is it going to be whether or not your income is above or below some arbitrary threshold? Are there other things that we might consider to decide if you are feeling the condition of poverty or not? How would we measure it? Okay. Um, and again, the idea is, 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 that, is that we'd like to maybe assess the scale of a problem. We'd like to policy purposes or even in telling a story, know how, how often this condition is taking place. Um, so, so there's this idea about what to measure, and then there's also a, a question about, about representation. Not, there are various ways to represent the same kind of data. Um, how many of you have read any Don Norman, the design literature? Oh, I would have expected at least one, boo. All right, so he writes about affordances of things. That is, certain things um, uh, 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 make things easier or harder. Their design makes things easier or harder, and we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but let's talk about a few, um, a few situations that we would turn into data, and let's talk about how you would do it and what their affordances are. So how do I represent a place as data? And by a place now, I don't want to, and I'm not like, a house with a thatched roof and, a, and an old man on the, on the front <laughs> and the stoop and a whatever. I just want like a, right here, this right here. Yes? Longitude and latitude. Longitude and latitude, awesome. Okay, and so longitude and latitude, what does that let us do easily? We can pinpoint from, from fixed positions in the equator and prime meridian, so we can get just an exact location, but we don't know altitude, we don't know. We don't know altitude, we could put that in there, we could put an altitude. Um, we also. But we know exactly where on the globe it is. Right? Now then, unwrapping that and looking at a map is a whole other thing, but we know exactly, we've, we've put down a coordinate system and we've put it there. Okay? Um, how else could we describe a place? A location. Yeah. Yes? Proximity to something else. Right, we could say that it's 20 miles from San Francisco, 15 miles from Sacramento, I'm not sure those two circles intersect, but anyway. Um, I should know these things, but um, uh, and so I could pick three other points, maybe triangulate. Um, what else? Address and zip code. Address and zip code, right? That's a that's a, a mail always finds itself to me if I'm given that as an address or, or given that as a location. Okay. So in the case of address and zip code or longitude and latitude, what what computations are hard? In other words, if I give you longitude, latitude, what is it hard? To, I give you two points. I give you here and there. What's hard to do with, yes? Deviation. Deviation, like? That's true. Um, everything kind of gets squished down to the singularity, right? 
What else? It's a slightly, yes. Right. It's hard to read it and go, oh, I know where that is. Whereas the, the address, at least you know what city it is, right? You know what state it is. That helps you immediately. The city helps you even more. Maybe you know something of the street, right? It's also hard to get the exact distance between two points. There's a formula that you have to invoke to get the distance between two points when you're lat long, right? So you have to do a little bit extra. You just can't compute it in your head, right? Whereas maybe distance from known objects will give you that more directly. So does this give you a sense of, right, there are multiple ways to represent? Um, what about time? I'm rattling off all the, the, the sort of the journalistic mainstays, right? The when, where, who, how, what, like. What do you mean what about time? What about time? <laughs> how, do, how do I represent time? <laughs> I like that, yes. Okay. I actually don't know what AP style for time is. What would that be? <laughs> Great. And is that uh, Pacific time, Eastern time? Does the AP know time zones? <laughs> You could do like time since dawn, right? How much time has passed since the sun came up, right? Um, uh, what else? Yeah. Can you do like a, like a digital or analog, like like a, like an hourglass? Sure. Like, like, like How many sands happens. through the time? Right. Exactly. Sure. Sure. Yes. You could do seasons. You could do generations of people. True. You could put it back in human terms. Sun yes. Clock. Sundial would give you another, right? So what, what computation, again, since we're thinking about doing sort of analysis or interpretation on these data, what, what kinds of things are, are easy or hard? If I, if I tell you that it's, uh, what is it, August 12th? Yes. Um, 2013, where did the summer go? Damn. Um, uh, 2013, and I, and I say, well, here's another time, maybe August 15th, 1913. How much time has passed between those two moments? Um, How many days? You have to specify time um, with reference to a location before you can make that computation. Okay, so suppose I do it precisely from right here, now in a, and, uh, and in February 12th, 1913. How many days have passed? Is that an easy computation? No. I mean, we could do it, right? We could like through and then count for leap years and like we could probably do it right um, so there's another another notion of time that's embedded in your computers right which is invokes an epoch in fact it often invokes the unix epoch which is january 1st 1970 and time is instead expressed as the number of seconds since january 1st 1970 so if you look at for example web access logs how many of you have, like on looked at google analytics or something for your website Right? So if the raw data that they're running on, the time is encoded as second since the epoch, second since the Unix, ep Unix epoch. Right? It's a long, long number. <laughs> right? But the nice thing about it is if I have time, one time expressed in a long number and another time expressed in a long number, then the amount of time between them, the number of seconds, is just the difference. Right? So I can very easily tell how much time has passed between two time periods just by taking a difference. Right? Because it's the Unix epoch, and that's when Unix came across, and someone had the bright idea that we need to have an epoch, and it, and it was all Unix, so there we are. I, I, I don't know what to tell you, except that the <laughs> Unix kids made it up and it stuck, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, but it's, you know, it's a nice, how many of you were born after January 1st, 1970? You were all born after January 1st, 1970. Ernest and I are the only two, uh, okay. Um, all right. Um, what about a song? <laughs> yes. Uh, 
So we could maybe look at something on a chart. But what about the the content of the song? Lyrics. Yeah. It has its own like time signature. Right. So we can think of it as a a, a wave, yeah. right? A sound wave. You guys, you all have audio training, right? So you've been staring at these sound waves for ages now, right? <laughs> what else? Notation. Right. Yeah. Music notation, right? Okay. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to get at this is that when you start to think about things in the world, even digital things, there are different representations that allow you to do different computations on them, right? That allow you to, to look at data in one way or another, or to make things easier, or make observations uh, more easily than another. Um, one example of, of a song piece, a data visualization that I absolutely love, is um, a piece by Martin Wattenberg, where he looks at the um, the motif, the, 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 note, the notation, the notes themselves, and find motifs that repeat. And those are large arcs that, that go over. And then smaller motifs that repeat are the smaller arcs. Right? And so you can see a song or the shape of a song by looking at the notation in that way. Um, here's uh, Clementine, oh my darling, oh my darling, right? So it's, yeah. Um, I think there's one more. This is like a prayer. Um, uh, right. But, but the idea is that certain visualizations, certain techniques, like you couldn't do this, for example, listening to or looking at the audio signal, right? That there's gonna be maybe slight variations in the way the person's singing and so on. Um, there are other representations. Yes? Um, that's the amazing example. Yeah. Why do this? What is the Oh, ow, that hurts. Can we, can we? <laughs> let's, let's try this again with a, with a happier, uh, happier. <laughs> I think this is a righteous thing to do, but I have a question. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I would like to understand like, you know, how you can apply that um, in the real world. Right, so, okay, is this a question or an answer? It's a quanser, yeah? <laughs> Right, you could, you, so, so there's a huge, a huge bank of interest now in the digital humanities, right? So the humanities, right? So for a long time, they've been toiling over manuscripts and you know, sung or whatever. The objects of the humanities, novels and so on, are becoming increasingly, uh, while well, becoming digitized, paintings, everything. Um, cultural artifacts are becoming digitized and hence open to, the, to computational processes, to interpretation as data. So you could start to ask, um, you know, when did particular turns of language enter in to, uh, uh, into, you know, sort of enter into popular usage by looking at writing? You can look at when particular kinds of song structures entered <coughs> in by looking at sort of different, right? So it depends on what your what your what your story is. Okay. Um, what I wanted to underscore here, though, is that that artifacts like songs and images and so on because they're digitized, are open to a data practice. They're open to you to think about and to work through, right? And that might be the source of stories. Does that answer? Yeah. You still have an unhappy look on your face, but I'm yeah. going to yeah. assume. Well, yes? I, get, I have an answer. Like, these days you have apps, like song catcher. You put your cell phone in front of a song playing, and it will tell you what's Right, so, so here's, here, here is an example of that. Here's another. Uh, uh, this is New York State of Mind by Jay-Z. This is a, uh, a time frequency spectrum. Not quite sure your audio tools have this. Do you guys have like a spectrogram on your tools? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Oh, you guys are the best. Um, so this is a spectrogram, right? So dark uh, means big, like large signal in that frequency band at that time period. Pale means nothing there, okay? Yeah, so yeah. here's the signature. Um, so something like, uh, something like Shazam, starts with that, that time frequency decomposition, that spectrogram. It starts by, um, it starts, so it takes the spectrogram, it starts and finds high points. It takes each of those high points, it looks forward from each high point forward and finds, let's say, five or 10 other high points. Um, and it encodes the signature of that little line that connects the, the original point to the point nearby. So see the points in the box up there? The box in a box, right? All of those get encoded, right? Um, uh, uh, and so what you get is a database of these sort of, um, these transitions from one high point to another high point. Um, and those get hashed in a way that it's easy for a computer to search. 
So each song gets reduced to a series of searchable high point pairs. Those get thrown into a huge database. You hold up your phone at a club and listen to it, right? And yes, you'll end up getting a slightly noisy spectrogram, but many of those high points will remain. And you'll be able to look those high points up in a database and say, that's what your song is. Okay? So another representation of a song is simply that spectrogram. And that spectrogram gives rise to pretty simple, actually shockingly simple algorithms that allow you to do things like Shazam, right, to identify songs. Okay? Um, and again, you could ask, what does that have to do with journalism? But the idea of the representation allowing you to make certain observations about, or to see things in a certain way, or to see differences in things that you couldn't have seen before is important. Um, so here, for example, is, is the Jay-Z, um, uh, is the spectrogram. Here are the constellations, the high points. Here are all the forward pieces that we would code up. Um, and then those get put into a, those get put into a, a database and then searched when a, a, a sample comes through. And what, you're, what, the, what the sample hopefully will have the same high points. And it'll so hopefully have, this, uh, since it has many of the same high points, it'll have many of those same transitions. And so what you can do is simply count for all the things in the database how many match. And if you get a lot of local matches, it means it's that song. Okay? Yes? So this is this is um, time and frequency. This says row and column. That's so unuseful. So it's um, <laughs> it's not very helpful. Um, it's uh, it's I think maybe the spectrogram is a little bit better. It says time and frequency here, right? So this is just the spectrogram you might have in your audio program, right? Time here, and then the frequency content going up the the y-axis. So. So those yeah. dots way up at the top there are moments of high frequency, lots of whatever, and the moments at the bottom are lots of the thump thump and when that comes in. Okay? Yes? So this is how Shazam looks like. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly how Shazam looks. In fact, they, they, they were really good enough to publish a paper by it, so anyone could make Shazam. In fact, I, when I teach coding to my <coughs> stat kids, the first, the first assignment was to make Shazam. It's not really that hard. <laughs> okay. Um, what about speech? Okay, and we're back to representation, right? Time. Time. What? What part of time? Like what's said when? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Transcription. Transcription, right? The actual text itself, maybe with or without time. Yeah. A word cloud. That's right. My my friend <laughs> my friend Jonathan Harris calls or Jacob Harris, rather, calls word clouds the mullets of the internet. <laughs> but, um, but yes, like a word cloud. <laughs> um, I don't mean to, sorry. Um, uh, I think they had their day. Um, uh, oh, dude, I am with you. I, I, am, I am totally with you. Looking at word frequencies, Right? Finding out which words are used. I think we have some nice examples of that. Right? So here's patterns of speech for the last 75 years in the State of the Union addresses. Right? This is some of the righteous New York Times data visualization work, right? Where you start counting how often often deficit is used by the different presidents and so on, right? I mean, uh, uh, or here again, State of the Union addresses now things even broken down by when in the speech the terms were used. Right, that can tell you something about their relative importance. Absolutely, text as data. In fact, the great thing about using text as data is that your stuff, your accumulated output is data. Right? Your story goes on a blog, it's indexed by Google. Google doesn't see it as that thing that you're gonna show your parents and that you are like so, so precious and I'm so proud of. They just see it as a bag of words, right? <laughs> Sorry, and it's that bag of words that's gonna then propagate, right? Um, uh, actually, this is a beautiful uh, piece from uh, Calvino, um, where he was describing, this is If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. How many of you have read it? Yes. So the, uh, the, um, the, the author was shocked to hear Ludmilla describe that um, she doesn't read anymore. Instead, she just simply takes 
uh, a, a, a novel and reduces it down to two columns. One is the word, and then the second is the number of times that word is used and sorts through it. And she says, in a, in a novel of 50 to 100,000 words, I advise you to look immediately uh, at the words that are repeated about 20 times. Look here, blood, uh, cartridge belt, commander, do, have, immediately, it, life, scene, sentry, shot, spider, teeth, together, you. Do you already have a clear idea of what it's about? <laughs> like she sort of reads in that, and that's sort of how Google's reading your, uh, and somehow in the 1800s, it was all about things like that, about taking text and turning it computational. So there was a beautiful field of stylometrics attempting to capture style through, through statistics, through things that were measured about text, in this case, word length. Um, uh, and because the dominant uh, visualization metaphor of the time was one of science and one of chemistry, in effect, um, there were lots of um, uh, spectra produced. So this is a spectra for George Bernard Shaw, and this is a spectra for H.G. Wells and for uh, Chesterton. Um, in terms of word lengths, right? The idea being that just like chemicals have their own individual spectra, chem maybe authors have it as well. Um, that's, and then, well, okay, we don't have to go to tragedy. Um, but, uh, but again, products of the digital humanities give us things like, uh, we'll talk about XML in a second, um, uh, specifications of, uh, of, of of, uh, of plays, let's say. Um, this is a XML, the extensible markup language. We'll talk about XML in a second. This represents um, uh, Hamlet. This is the, the big soliloquy. You see at the top, uh, eventually you'll see the word to, token, to be or not to be. That is the question, whether it is, right? Do we see it? Yeah. Okay, right, so, and in addition to each of the words, we also know um, it's part of speech. Right, so two is a uh, PCACP. Oh, I can't remember what PCACP is, but um, but uh, 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 it's a preposition. But it's a preposition that can be something else. Uh, uh, the um, be, uh, the is, is DT, which is a determiner. It's like a and the. Um, uh, there are a bunch of forms of, of to be. So you can take text and break it down into parts of speech, and suddenly you could talk about grammar. You could talk about semantics. You could take text and make it much more, more lively. So the, the idea is that even text as data doesn't just have to be words. You can start to understand something of the grammar and the functioning of those words. right? And it doesn't have to be how happy is Twitter, which drives me up a wall, but it can be other sort of observations. Oh, and this is... Um, this is this is text and this is text and uh, and images. So this is um, a beautiful project that's looking at um, stories. Uh, page one from a variety of newspapers. Um, different topics being colored in red. So that particular article that's on a topic is colored red. And you can look at the total area that the newspapers are devoting on the front page to a particular topic versus the number of tweets on that topic to see if there's a disconnect between what Twitter's talking about and what official news sources are talking about. Because you journalists seem sort of crazy for Twitter. And somehow this is like interesting comparison. Um, this is the piece about Occupy Wall Street. And did Twitter get it before the for the official sources did. Um, OK, I'm not going to bore you with like what's a recipe, what's a color, although we know color is three numbers, right? You guys have had HTML, know that you could do RGB to get color, right? Um, uh, or if you just have grayscale, so uh, uh, eight bits. Uh, you could talk about an image, uh, data. Uh, um, uh, that's the only dorky Star Trek. <laughs> um, you could also talk about social networks, right, and how you represent a social network and the ties between us. Um, I did a lot of work with the, um, the Los Angeles uh, Public, uh, Unified Public School District, and um, uh, 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 one of the things we did was try to suss out the sort of, uh, like an introductory icebreaker was to create the social network of the, of the people in the room. Many of the teachers didn't know each other, but they ended up knowing people near each other, so we started drawing sort of networks of each other. This actually is an art piece from Josh Ahn called They Rule, which looks at all of the uh, 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 executive boards of companies to see who's shared between different companies. So you can see how tightly different companies are. It's a pretty sweet application. Um, actually, out of curiosity, 
I mean, we've all seen these kind of ball and stick models for social networks, right? Where people are dots, or actually in this case, people are people. And Josh was very sweet. The people who get paid more are much fatter than the ones who are paid less. <laughs> uh, but people are people, right? But often people are just dots. Um, and then what connects them is a line. Have we all seen that kind of sort of display before? Do you know where that comes from? Exactly, it comes from chemistry. So um, the very first, this is a piece, this is a, an article from the New York Times in 1933. Um, and it's looking at uh, the very first time a social network was sort of presented. I looked at a, 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 a couple of girls' schools um, and looked at the connections between them. Um, Jacob Moreno, who was the designer of that, of that display, um, this was his social network for, those, for the girls. It was all hand-drawn again. Um, but his, uh, his inspiration was looking at sort of chemistry models and in fact um, wrote about the social atom, right? So for him, the dominant scientific visualization came from, again, chemistry, but this time those chemical structures and that informed the visualization, right? So again, data have context, data are, you know, part of a, Visualization has context. Visualization comes from somewhere. So when you see something, stop and think, you know, again, what is it, what is it getting me to, what is it, where is it coming from and what is it, this is a beautiful, sorry, this is him, I, I don't know, anyway. I, I'm thinking that at some point, when I get just a little bit older, I'm gonna have to have a dramatic picture of myself <laughs> taking around a big sigma or something like that, but anyway. Um, the social, the social atom was his idea, again, borrowing quite strongly from science. Um, all right, so, um, uh, all right, so you may think of, of data as tables of numbers, um, uh, um, but, um, but the objects that are open to a data practice are quite varied, so it's not just really numbers, it's, it's text, it's image, it's uh, like the world out there, it's us, um, and in fact, the products of your journalistic interests, your stories, are data. Um, so, for example, um, a, a very simple application, that these next few examples are gonna let us talk about data types, so while it feels like we haven't really gone anywhere, we're getting somewhere now. Um, this is a project called News Diffs. Um, it's basically what its name suggests. It's pinging five or six big news organizations every five minutes and pulling down every single story that's there and comparing the story to the way it was five minutes ago to track changes. Um, so you could look at, for example, this is the, uh, 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 the, the uh, Obamacare decision. Uh, the green is the new piece, the red outline is the revised piece, or the piece that got dropped, and you could see over five minutes how did the story change. Um, and it's happening pretty, uh, what's well, happening all the time for a, a chunk of story. This is um, the, the Beyonce limp syncing. Um, and so you see you know, things being added, things being changed, things being turned around. Um, just out of curiosity, what goes into a system like that? Oh, and oh, by the way, before I say that, this is your work, your hard work, up on the web, someone watching it, someone watching you change your mind. Oh, new facts. Oh, I've got a co-author who knows more than I do. Oh, I got that wrong or whatever it is, right? I mean, hopefully not too often I got that wrong. Um, uh, and we're applying this through the Brown Institute. We funded a project that's doing this in China to, to look for post-publication censorship in, among Chinese uh, publications where it may be a government or a corporate entity saying, take that down. We don't like the way you worded that. Um, but so this is your work. Um, what do you think goes into building a system like this? Clear what it's doing, right? Every five minutes, grabbing, thing, bringing it in, looking for differences. What do we got to do for this? Yeah. First, you just have to find a way to break it down into just raw text, you know, independent of whatever formatting elements are on, mm -hmm. and then kind of set like a you know, download it every however long. Great. So we need a program, a process that every five minutes goes and says, in fact, let's imagine if we just did this ourselves, right? Because there have been long stretches of time where I've had absolutely nothing to do except sit there and poke on 
a, re a refresh a browser uh, every five minutes. So you could pay me five cents to do that for a, a day or two. So suppose I, I'm just sitting there clicking, pulling it down, downloading it, right? Now I have, a, what, an HTML document. All the text is in there. I just have to take a difference between those two pieces of text, okay? Um, so the data format in this case, the data of your stories, is coming in something called the hypertext markup language. You've all heard of HTML, right? Has anyone not? And don't be bashful. <laughs> Although it's hard to not be bashful in a room of <laughs> 200 people, but uh, anyway. Um, so HTML is, is, um, is a, a language used to describe documents on the web, your stories on the web. It's designed as a, as a piece of data, to dis or as a data structurer, it's designed to talk about documents. It has tags for paragraphs, tags for headings, tags for tables. All the stuff that goes into a document is described in HTML. So in that sense, it's a really handy thing for describing data if data are a document, right? If data is a news story. Um, so, uh, so one thing then this will have to do is, you, the, this news disk is going to have to do, is, um, is figure out in this sort of, and actually how many of you on a web page done the view source thing? So you look at the underline, that's awesome. Why were we viewing the source? It feels kind of dirty. See how it works. See how it works? See when something's wrong. See when it's wrong, okay. Yeah? So when someone has embedded a video on YouTube, of YouTube in a page, and there's no direct link there, you can still look at it. I see, okay. <coughs> yeah? Right, to say, hey, that's sexy, I want that too. <laughs> right. And I'll give them credit for it too. <laughs> yeah? Sure. Good. So we can we can view the source, we can have a look at it. What you'll also notice for like news stories like um, uh, on the Times, there's a whole lot of advertising. So you're gonna have to you don't want to really have this news dip thing decide that the ad has changed, because that doesn't sound very interesting. You're gonna need to be able to find out where the content is. And so that's uh, maybe a little bit harder. Um, but that's something we can do. Um, so in what Web 1.0 then, um, uh, all the data that was out there on the web, whether it was news stories, addresses, even tables of information, everything was published as an HTML document. That's Web 1.0, right? Just a world of documents. Um, uh, uh, part of the magic behind Google News is that it can figure out what's news story versus what's advertising and then do the kind of aggregation that it's doing in an automated way. That's sort of the genius behind it. That's like one of the hard problems that it cracked. Um, the document clustering, not so hard, but sorry. Oh, we're recording. Okay, so, um, and then uh, 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 with Web 2.0, what we find is the idea that um, that HTML is really good for circulating documents, but it's not really good for circulating data, right? It's not really a good format for sending data around. So what we're going to have a look at is what, what data looks like on the web now. And this is a kind of web 2.0 reflex. So web 1.0 was all about documents and, um, and maybe you creating a document. Web 2.0 is about data um, and about sharing data, about mashing up use that term in a long time, but about mashing up uh, uh, services um, and the, the easy use of, of data from one service to another, format, the easy formatting of one service to another is sort of the soul of Web 2.0. Um, by the way, I have the students um, implement this eventually in my class and you know, you steal some code from, well don't steal, you borrow, use with attribution code from Google that does the diff stuff and then you can do this kind of diff stuff yourself. Um, all right, so um, before I get to like a formal description of what XML is and what Web 2.0 is, one other little piece of, of sort of life cycle that might be interesting to think about is data um, as we go out sort of in the world, and that is um, how do your documents, how does your story circulate, right? You all are looking at, there's a lot of people who have been looking at Google Analytics, right? right? And how many times was, uh, like a blog post do you sort of watch Twitter and see it get retweeted? Yeah, okay. Um, so um, at, the, at the New York Times, I spent uh, my sabbatical a couple of years ago at the New York Times um, working on a project that was specifically about looking at how Times content moved across Twitter. Who was sharing Times links? We had a beautiful data set 
um, that was consisted of browsing activities, web server logs, the kind of stuff that Google Analytics draws on. So we watch you browsing the site. This is generic body language for browsing the site. So here you are tapping away. Um, uh, seeing some, oh, that's an interesting article. So we then partnered with Bitly, the URL shortener. Do we all know Bitly? Okay. So they gave us some data. We, so we can watch a big URL from the Times become a small URL. We can watch that small URL appear on Twitter. We can watch it get tweeted and retweeted. And then we can watch the small URL get big as people come back to the site and then browse more. So in effect, your, mor your morning activities, that clicking in the morning, sends you up to Twitter, the, pink, the blue being browsing events, the pink being tweets, the yellow being people clicking on tweets, um, and then blue being the, the kinds of things they go on to read once they come back to the New York Times. So what we created was a data visualization to try to describe all of that. Yes? Bitly is um, nyti.ms, so it's the main shortener that the Times uses. Um, it also at the time was the biggest one. Tico has slowly sucked the air out of all of that, um, but this was a couple years ago and we felt righteous and with it. <laughs> um, so here's the data visualization we put together, and again, this is something I think we could um, work. So, uh, time is moving out on the x-axis. You see the little flag, five hours, six hours, seven hours. Each pink dot's a tweet. Um, each yellow dot is something, someone clicking on that tweet and coming back to the site. We step up. Um, each time someone retweets someone else, you get one degree away. And it kind of builds up. Up at the top, you have a cumulative, uh, like an accounting for all the number of things that have happened so far. And then around hour 26, you get this huge spike. Um, there, you see this big spike happen, and then you can go and you can walk up the side of the. I know it's a little sexy, right? You can walk up the um, walk up the spine. The, this whole cascade was kicked off by Valdis Krebs. He was retweeted by these people who retweeted these people who retweeted those people. Blah 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 blah. Until eventually, you see the big spike was caused by the Zappos CEO uh, tweeting about the story. All this activity is for one story. It's called, but will it make you happy? And it was about, should you buy things or should you buy experiences? Right? And it's sort of fascinating for the Zappo CEO, right? I sell shoes and handbags, right? To be tweeting about whether or not you should buy experiences or things. So this data visualization then was about looking at networks that get activated when people start to, you know, certain topics activate certain networks of people. What does that look like? Um, uh, can you make some understanding of that, right? And all of that is data that is, um, in principle, available to you. The big part of what we were doing was um, looking at tweets and retweets, right? We could cut off a lot of the other stuff. Um, the, the, the big pink pieces would have been just fine just looking at the data you could pull from Twitter. Yeah? So that's a good question. So should we use that data in editorial? Should we use that data in, in sort of as for editorial decisions? <coughs> yeah? I mean, I can't help but think about this. this uh, I mean, how do you guys, uh, first of all, I'm how do the organizations are aware of like, that person on the person on the person on the person on the top of that, I mean, how would a uh, website like that affect the editorial decisions? Because, I, you know, everybody's so quick to be the first in SEO. Everybody wants to be the first, you know, story that pops up. And then, you know, you know Right, and that's a head in hand with what you're asking about about the cascade and about about you know do I want like some of the biggest cascades we had were like you know the the guy who went crazy on the JetBlue airplane right this is a while ago now but or or um, uh, the uh, the uh, 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 Steve Jobs' sister who wrote an article for the for the Times that was another huge huge cascade. So the, the question is, and, and this is a generic question, this goes back to your point. Once you start to measure something, how does it change professional practice? Right? Once, you once you start to measure a thing, how does it change what you do? Right? So in healthcare, people think measurement is a good thing, right? because if I can measure 
If I can provide five different treatments for pneumonia and see that if I do this one treatment as a hospital, the people always get better, but if I do these other ones, they don't, then I'll focus on this. So there's a kind of evidence-based medicine, evidence-based practices of various kinds. Now the question is, what happens when that intersects with things like editorial judgment, right? With, with editorial decision making. Um, too quickly, people start calling it pandering, right? Um, so uh, interestingly, when I first started working for the Times, the, um, the, the presence of any kind of web statistics was verboten in the newsroom. The, the journalists were not supposed to know, um, like how many clicks or whatever, right? Um, because I think it was still the first draft of history, right? So why do we care about, you know, in fact, I was at a, um, one of the page one meetings, so every four o'clock there's a meeting uh, to decide what goes on page one. And the last one I went to was, well actually the second to last one I went to was when um, uh, Paris Hilton got released from prison. Right? And so we're going around the room and the editors are like, oh, this blew up and this happened and this horrible thing happened. And then the web guy said, you know, people are searching our site looking for Paris Hilton. <laughs> and the editor's like, I, you know, that's not really my job, right? We're not here to tell them about Paris Hilton. And he said, but our readers want to know about it, but that's not what we're here for. And then the, the entertainment person pipes up and says, well, our piece really isn't about Paris Hilton. It's about how um, celebrities can't get a fair shake in the legal system. So maybe it's not really about Paris Hilton. And it's so the big back and forth, back and forth. In the end, she was on the front page, below the fold, tiny picture even of her, like that little profile picture. So it's a, it's a negotiation. And what you're finding with Twitter is that the reporters that what, you know, and, and you probably should talk to a real journalist and not a statistician who's just hung out with them. But I've noticed, <laughs> I've noticed a change from, you know, at least in the editorial side, from you're not supposed to know to we're having a conversation with our readers, right? That Twitter opens up a kind of conversation. So that's something that happens. But, the same way that happens with the editing, right? Right. right. Um, but but what's, what's interesting is the intersection between evidence based practice and connoisseurship. This will happen in lots and lots of places. We're doing a project for the Museum of Modern Art now, and I asked one of the curators, since you know everything there is to know about which shows get attended, how many people are gonna show when it rains, how many people are show when it's sunny outside, how many people show during the Puerto Rican Day Parade, like you know everything about us users coming through, does that affect how you curate? Does that affect your job and what you do and what you put up on the wall? Right? Because for MoMA, I guess the equivalent of cat videos would be Monet all the time, right? Just more water lilies, more water lilies, right? And she's like, no, you know, you don't. I mean, her response, this was uh, Paola Antonelli, who's the design curator there, head design curator there. She said, when you're faced with, in this situation, when you're faced with data and with measurement, you are really called back to your values and ethics as an institution, right? How are you going to deal with it? How are you going to make use of it? But the effect of counting and what that all means is extremely important to talk about and talk through. Yes? Okay, so this is slightly abstract, but basically from what you just said about the ethics of this type of field and the type of data. So it's kind of similar to how the hearing aids when there's no censorship when it first comes out, but we get into ethically. So from a business standpoint, from a journalistic standpoint, how are we able to get that type of data with the truth rather than have business for our own personal promotion or business interest? Right, so by that kind of data, you mean? What she, what she just explained, the, the same data that the curator is going to know, like I don't right. need to be with the curator, I need to be with the curator. I have that all the information, so I can market right. to that field to make more money for myself. But is that ethical? Of course it's, I mean, if I have an awesome person tracker in a museum, of course it's ethical. I, I mean, I, there's nothing unethical about offering the service. It's the question of what you do with it afterwards, I think. In this case, I don't know that there's anything unethical about offering the service. And, and, and if we pr bring it back to web transactions, your presence or absence on a website, right, is is something that that the New York Times knows that you know if you own a website, right? You know what IP address is coming if you force people to sign up for it. You know who's coming and going. I don't, I'm not quite sure where I'm. I'm probably, there are lots of privacy and ethical questions around there, but just the act of seeing who goes where, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure I'm there with you yet. I, mean, I might not be understanding the question. Well, like, like I said, it's kind of abstract. I'm just thinking from the, from the business standpoint and how we can make money, whereas if I'm a journalist, I don't need that information to be um, able to carry out science stories and have some more fact basis in it that could have a positive impact. Right. 
Well, so let, here, here, maybe here's another, maybe here's an example of this, right? So, so we've seen we've seen HTML as a structure for as a way to circulate data. Um, here's another another kind of or another structuring another tool for structuring data. Um, this is uh, this is just a tweet. Um, uh, this was from uh, last year. Uh, the first thing I do when I go to a conference or something, and maybe many of you do this, is just a tweet just landed in, right? Just touched down in, just landed in. Just, right? Does anybody do that besides me? <laughs> just to tell your people that you're okay and there wasn't a horrible thing that happened. Um, not that there are all that many people who care, but at least there's <laughs> well, someone there that would go, oh, that's nice. So, so Twitter, um, right, is, uh, uh, has a search engine. And you could go ahead and look for things like that. So you could have a look for just landed in and see all the people who have just landed in and figure <laughs> out where they where they're you know where they've just landed in, right? Where where did they where have they been arriving? Um, and my good friend Jer Thorpe had the idea that if I can cross if you can cross that with looking at their profile and seeing where they live, maybe you now have an arc that says where they started and where they landed, right? So you get a, a kind of an, an arc of, of people moving around the world. And maybe that gets captured then simply in Twitter and people's, people's contributions. Um, so that search that, that we did here, that search can also be done through an automated process that we'll talk about a whole lot more next time um, called um, an API, an application programming interface. And this is a way whereby one computer program can fetch data from another computer program. And, and toward the end of the lecture today, we are going to talk about programming um, as opposed to accessing things from a spreadsheet. Um, and so you can issue this kind of request. Instead of by typing it into your browser, you'll be able to issue it from a program and get back the data that you can in turn manipulate and work with. Um, so an application programming interface makes data available as a kind of web service. So um, it's using the mechanics of the web, the addressing mechanism of the web, but instead of offering you a web page, like the New York Times homepage, it's offering you some data. So if you go to, let's say, search.twitter.com, search.json, and you, and you put in that sort of query string, the question being the thing, the query string, what you're looking for here is just landed in. Um, the percent 22, percent 20, percent 20, percent 22, those are um, sort of escaped spaces or escaped characters. So URLs aren't allowed to have spaces in them, and they're not allowed to have quotes in them. So this is a way to get that stuff in there. Um, it, it's a way to encode a quote or a, or a space in an, in an ASCII character. Okay? Uh, and we'll come back to some ASCII stuff next time. It feels a little low level for the first day, so <laughs> I wait till the second. Um, yes? So I, I, complete, I completely agree. Again, data are human and inherits our blind spots and inherits um, our some sense of our global, however they've been manifested, priorities, right? So there are places that, that are, are not getting attention and, and measurement isn't happening. That doesn't mean that there aren't people on the ground who are trying to collect data and document situations and things. Groups like Mobile Active are working to um, to have, you know, to enable you know, simple cell phone uh, data collection around, you know, to help document um, sort of political situations of various kinds. So you're exactly right. There is, there, there are inequalities here all, all over the place, and and it would be, it would be worthwhile. And you don't actually have to go very far um, outside of the city for that to be true, right? There are a lot of situations that are that for a long time were undocumented that are starting to be more more visible. Um, so you're exactly right, but and I was hoping to catch the, capture that in that humanness of it, right? That there is there is nothing, there is no omni, omniscient something or other data layer out there <coughs> that twitches when something bad happens in the world if there's no one there to watch it or there's nothing there recording it. Yes. Search our APIs. Um, 
So, um, so uh, what um, increasingly um, companies are realizing that other people, and, and organizations, right? So the MTA had a big hackathon. New York City has a big hackathon. It says, here's our data, make something with it, right? And an API is a way to, to offer people data in a regularized way, right? So if I'm going to build an application on top of Twitter like this just landed in, Right? Suppose I want to do this regularly and make a little app on the phone so I can look at all the other people who just landed in Houston when I land there. Or I can look at my friends and see where they just landed. So I could easily make a little application for that. And to be able to do that though means that I need to be able to talk to Twitter consistently and get answers from Twitter. And so the dialogue back and forth between Twitter, the, the data provider, and me, the data consumer, is made possible through this application programming interface. It's a regularizer that describes both how I fetch data as well as the form that data come back. So in this case, this HTTP Twitter blah, 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 that's a call to the API. Um, and instead of getting a web, so, and Q equals means that's the query I'm searching for. So it is a regularized way for me. I could put anything in there. I could put bananas and get back all the tweets that have the term bananas in them. Um, and I'm looking for just the recent tweets, type equals recent. And what I'll get back from that is data that look like this, not like a web page. Right? This is an example of something called JSON, the JavaScript object notation. Um, so instead of, instead of it being a web page with angle brackets and, and you know, head here and paragraph there, the data are given a particular form. You see curly brackets that mark out entities, structures, um, and then Right, maybe the tenth line down, you see the word results with a square bracket, and then what you see are a series of curly brace things that follow after after it. Each one of those curly brace things represents a different tweet. Okay, so the first one was created Tuesday, nineteenth of June, two thousand twelve. Um, it's from user because I because is I said so. uh, because I said so. Uh, see. <laughs> I'm the numbers person, you're the words person. So you can read and I can. So um, uh, it has their ID string. Um, it has, uh, uh, what else? Uh, result type. Um, uh, eventually it has the text, just landed in Baltimore, yay. Um, and, and away it goes, OK? Um, so you see that the, the data now have a regular structure, right? So it's not. Paragraph, 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 table, whatever. Instead, it's the tweets are surrounded by these curly braces, and then there are name like uh, uh, tags like username, ID, and so on, and then value separated by a colon. Okay, so there's a very regular structure to the data that's coming back. Okay, and what we'll see next time is you can write a program to easily decode that. Right, the program will all the program needs is a little help. Right? It says, oh, it's going to be of this type. They're going to be, they're going to be uh, uh, attributes, attribute names, colon, and then attribute values. Name, value, name, value, name, value. So from user, because I said so, four, because presumably there were three other because I said so's. Um, uh, and then their ID, their, their, user, their full username, and so on. That that regular structure represents a tweet. And you got that, if you look at the top, by entering that into your browser. Okay? So what comes back is not a web page, but data. It's the difference between Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. Web 1.0 circulated data as web pages, maybe something you might see like this. Web 2.0 re represents it this way. And a computer can digest this, and a computer can And you'll see that it's a relatively straightforward thing to do. Okay? Is that clear? The distinction between what's coming back? What's null? So, no, null? Null just means empty, that they didn't offer it. Yes? If you add a geo tweet to that, so that you can tell that that person is coming back to randomly or something else, 
Yeah, uh, the problem is only 5% of Twitter, uh, I think five, between five and 10%, the number seems to keep growing, but between five and 10% of tweets have geotags attached to them. So you're probably better off doing that search on Instagram, because 85% of those photos have, have, uh, have, have geotag. In other words, a lat long attached to it, or some coordinate attached to it. Um, so for example, um, it, this, is, this was my sort of Twitter page. Right, and the top tweet there, this is now represented in the browser as HTML. And if you look at and you view the source, you see that the tweet is somehow buried here in all that styling. Um, the tweet actually was, what's the term here? Lots of cool pictures from PC forum. I gotta believe that's not possible. But um, <laughs> so you uh, have here, where, where is it? Uh, uh, I can't even it's see it. Line. It's the top line. It's very top, okay, yeah, there it is at the top. Lots of cool pictures from PC Forum. See, but as a paragraph, right? So screen scraping in the old days would have to look for paragraphs of that class to know where the tweet was, okay? Whereas with, with JSON, we know where the tweet is um, because it's labeled, right? It's exactly there. I don't have to go hunting around for it. Is that clear? Right? HTML, good at documents. When data aren't a document, you ship it around in another format. JSON is one of those formats. Um, all right. Uh, and we can talk about sort of more of that. Just to, to finish, uh, this is the application my friend ended up making, um, wow. showing people moving from one place to another. Um, there's a little time clicker going up at the top. Um, uh, looks like it's, I mean, it's, it's heavily accelerated because the number of tweets we just landed in is pretty small. Yeah, these are all from tweets looking at the just landed in. And then starting with where they came from, that's the origin, and then where they landed is the arc. And then the crazy sort of frog-like hopping that he tried to make look non-militaristic. <laughs> so many people going to Pardon? America. That would only be tweets in English, right? That that would be only tweets in English. That's right. Because they're all starting going to America. Mostly Americans, yeah. Right. I mean, what are the what are the Brits what do the Brits say when they land? <laughs> <laughs> or. <laughs> the airplane scares and confuses us. We don't, like, I don't know. What is the, there's an expression, right? Not a just landed in. it. Is there something else? <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, that's that. So the other thing that's interesting here, um, that just to tell you again how data propagate, um, if we look at this, if we look at these tweets, right? Uh, I only landed in, uh, 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 in uh, or blah, blah, blah. just landed in Baltimore, uh, just landed in Florida. To be able to do this and recognize and be able to draw that arc, what do I have to do to this text? We know that they have just landed in in it. What else? City. I have to figure out it's a city. Well, what if it's not a city? Because like, that poor guy just landed in Florida. That's not going <laughs> to splatter it all over the state. Huh? Airports. Airplanes? Airports. 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 Right. Like, right. Some of them are airports, right? So what do you have to do here to be able to make that arc? Um, IP addresses? IP addresses? Yeah. There are no IP addresses on Twitter, right? Just a, not a program a, that can sort it. Yes. Right, so we're going to have to figure out, so we're going to have to do a little work here. This is called named entity extraction. We're going to have to go and look at the tweet and say, are there things in here that I know to be geographic locations, right? Like Florida or Baltimore or, uh, uh, or uh, just landed in my backyard or <laughs> just landed in Melbourne, right? <laughs> We have to recognize that those things are places, okay? And that places have location, like they have maybe lat long or something, right? We talked about how to specify location. And that can be done with a beautiful service from Reuters called uh, Open Calais, 
and you give it a sentence. Um, here's an example. So you can, get, you can try this out on the web. Uh, just landed in Houston. Here's just a few of the tweets. Just landed in, in beautiful and sunny Madrid. Mm -hmm. It will go through and identify for you those things that represent places. Okay? How did it do? I mean, so the things are underlined if it's a place. So it, it did pretty well, but it missed Madrid, right? Well, that's a whole other problem. Like that's that's the gap between data and lived experience, right? That's so there is a that, that's the same gap with language, right? So someone's going to have to know, right? There's there's no magic here. So my point is that is that Open Calais is another web service, right? You can post to Open Calais a phrase, right? There will be a way, just like the URL that you gave to Twitter to get the tweets back, there will be a way to post a phrase using a special URL, and it will return for you a marked up version of that phrase that tells you where things like people and places are. And then you can process that, okay? So the spirit of Web 2.0 is that service builds on service, builds on service, builds on service, because data are formatted in a way that flow easily between them. Okay? You don't have to work very hard to figure it out. Because if every time you had to like decode a web page or do some screen scraping or something, nobody would build anything. Right? So the, the fact that things sort of flow through these processes and let you build one on top of the other is the genius of it. Yes? Yes. Right. <coughs> Absolutely. Hook, line, and sinker, right? That's why you have to not only interrogate your data, like if someone gave you a data set of, like we'll look at stop and frisk in a second, right? Not only do you inherit data, but you also inherit algorithms, right? And there is this irritating belief that algorithms are objective, right? That things like this are objective. And they inherit the same biases and sensitivities as everything else, right? So while algorithms are certainly systematic, they're in no, by no means objective. And so you have to do a little work to understand whether or not this thing is giving you what you want it to do, right? You have to write the code and look at how many tweets don't have places attached to them, or run this for a day, do a random sample of 500 tweets, and just see if it's doing the right thing. Right? Look long term what's going on, maybe plot them out according to geographic uh, to geography and see is it leaving out some parts of the world consistently. Right? It's your responsibility as consumer to, to make sure that, you, that what it's doing is what you expect it to do. Okay? All right. So more on data formats. The, the other data format that we'll talk about just briefly, we mentioned a second ago, is XML, the extensible markup language. Tweets also come in XML if you want them. Um, but maybe the easiest XML you could get um, comes from another API. Um, this is, uh, oh shoot. Um, this is uh, uh, a, a kind of unpublished API from Google. So you know when you're typing and Google starts to give you suggestions? Right, of what you might be interested in. Yeah. There's, a, there's a, a dialogue going on between your browser and the Google servers. So you could use this special URL, suggestqueries.google.com, with, um, with, let's say, in this case, the query at the very end, data is a, right? So do you see the query at the very end up there? Data is a with the percent 20s. <laughs> and what it'll turn back for you is um, a list of uh, or an XML representation of um, some suggestions. So XML looks a lot like HTML in the sense that you have angle brackets, but instead of those angle bracket tags being paragraphs and headings and whatever that are representing structures of a document, instead now they represent structures of whatever kind of data they represent. So the Google designer said that, um, that there'll be, let's say, uh, a tag for complete suggestions, and then the individual suggestion with data is a game changer, or another suggestion which data is R. Another suggestion is data is a representation of information, or data is a toaster, right? <laughs> so you see that, that the structure now, the, the, the tags you're using 
not paragraph or heading, but tags that are adapted to the information that Google is trying to convey. In the same way that the JSON uh, attributes and name, like uh, names and, and um, objects, so user ID and uh, because I said so for, uh, those things are well specified, these are well specified in the same way. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, and so that's the, this is then the basis of, let's say, another beautiful visualization um, that, that makes use of this unpublished API and asks things like, why is America, and then does that from servers in different countries, um, just to see what the recommendations might be. So, in the United States, we want, why is America so fat, so great, and dead? Um, the UK wants to know, why is America so violent, so expensive, so cloudy? Um, uh, uh, but again, API builds on top of and exposes new services. All right, so thank you. So okay, so before I get lost here, what we're going to look at today and tomorrow? Well, we have exactly three minutes. Um, so. Uh, um, we're going to uh, finish with looking at some data, and I'm going to give you a small assignment. There are too many of you for me to actually conceivably grade this assignment, but our TAs are here to help you with this assignment. Um, uh, and it has to do with the stop and frisk data that's been published. Um, you could grab, uh, well, the New York Times, uh, when the, a couple of years ago when this first story came out, um, made some beautiful graphics of um, this, not only where the stop and frisk happened, but um, sort of uh, uh, relating that to the number of violent crimes in the US, or in, the, in New York City versus the number of, of, uh, of, uh, of stop and frisk happening. Um, and actually I had a student last semester who did their project on stop and frisk in Brooklyn and it was shocking to me to see that, that if you look at the full, the full uh, 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 complement of data that was available, there were very few places in this neighborhood he was looking at that you weren't like 10 feet away from someone, some place where someone was stopped and frisked at some point, right? It's kind of an amazing thing just that just about anywhere you were standing, someone had previously been like approached. But um, so the data are available in a couple of places. Uh, the New York Civil Liberties Union makes it available. Um, and you can see down here that they make it available through downloadable files. They make them available in something called a CSV file. So we've seen XML, we've seen HTML, we've seen JSON as a way of representing data. A CSV is perhaps the oldest and most basic form of data. It stands for comma separated values. It's as simple as you can imagine. It's like a table where, I mean it represents basically a table where each row in the file is a different, is a different unit of observation and then the different attributes that you are recording are separated by commas. Um, so they're giving it to you as a CSV with a PDF document that describes what all the fields mean. Um, by the way, PDF, portable document format, it's another way that people make data available. Um, uh, given that we only have a couple minutes, we won't go into it much except to say that it sucks. As a, as a, it's, a, it's all about presentation and not about pulling data from it. Okay, and we'll see that later. There are presentation formats for data. Right? Things look pretty and are outlined. There are other formats that let you grab the data and do something with it. CSV lets you grab the data and do something with it. Um, the New York Police Department itself makes it available. Um, if you look here though, it makes it available in something called SPSS, or they even actually spelled it wrong the first time, SPPS. It's SPSS, um, which is, was an IBM product that is um, basically used for statistics in the social sciences. So when the, when the New York, the NYPD publishes it, they're publishing it in a specialized format made to be used with a particular software product. In this case, IBM's SPSS, which is something statistical, something in the social sciences. Um, and it's again used by social scientists. So the publication here of data um, is telling you who the police department thinks its intended audience is. Right? How many of you know what SPSS is? Oh, I'm surprised, great. So those of you who know what SPSS is, you'd be able to download this and you'd be happy. Right? For those of you who don't know what SPSS is, this could be a block. You go, wait, I don't know how to use that, I don't know how to, I don't know how to think about it. Um, thankfully, this more portable format, the CSV that just about any program can read, 
is available through the NYCLU. Um, um, but this is all to say that data publication, so data are human, data publication is a political act. Data publication tells you something about who's intended to use it, right? And you will make it easier for some people to use and harder for other people to use, okay? Um, so there it is, data is um, By the way, if you want to know anything about these data technologies that we're talking about, Paul Morrell has a beautiful book. Um, here. Um, here's a whole bunch of stuff about CSV that we're not going to go into, um, and markup, which we're also not going to go into, but I'll put them on the web, and if you're ever interested in a whole lot of words. So what we're going to finish with is um, two and a half seconds of walking through um, a spreadsheet for looking at the, um, the, uh, the uh, stop and frisk data. Um, there are two that I would recommend that are sort of open source. Um, I wouldn't recommend Excel because it's a, it's a, for, you, know, you have to buy it and it's closed and anyway, buying software is a political act. Um, and uh, so LibreOffice or um, OpenOffice, and I'll show you this in OpenOffice. Uh, OpenOffice has something called Calc. Um, by the way, uh, as I've tortured you with, or I've tortured the Stabile students with before, anytime you pick up a piece of software, um, Inevitably, that software embeds within a model of the world and in turn acts as an argument for that model. So um, uh, there are certain things that you are able to do in, in some software packages. They make some things easier and some things hard. And slowly over time, they bend you to their will. Right? You will do the easy things because they're easy. It will reward you. And you won't do the hard things because they're hard. Right? And so, so you, you need to be very careful just as you, as you interview data, you should interview your software tools to make sure that you're not opening up some kind of bias or blind spot because certain things are hard and you just don't want to do them. Um, we'll talk about that later. So if we were to open up the data and I'll send you the URL for it, I don't have no idea how I send email to the whole class. I'll well, we'll figure that out. Um, so this is open office. It looks sort of just like Excel except maybe Less so. Um, you can grab um, from the web. You can grab the uh, the the, uh, the stop and frisk data. Um, there are 101 columns, and I've made a smaller sample. The 2012 data has 500,000 rows, and I've made a smaller version with only 5,000 that you could play with first, um, and then you could take the whole thing. Um, and this is basically what the data look like. Each row represents um, a different stop and frisk incident. You have the year, the precinct the date of the stop, the time of the stop, um, the gender of the person being stopped, their race, their date of birth, their age, and so on. Okay. How many of you have played with the spreadsheet before? Okay, great. So you've done things like um, maybe take the data here and add names to it, right? So now you can now use the first row maybe as, as names so that they don't appear as data, they appear as names of the columns. Um, and then you can start to do things like, what's the average age of the person who was stopped and frisked? Um, so you would put a simple, uh, there's a simple formula language where you say equals average, um, and then you would give a range over which you want the data taken. Um, so in this case, we want column, rom romantically enough, column J, num row two, all the way through row J, number 501, because this is an even smaller data set that only has 500 points. Um, and then you see the happy average, and then it'll compute that for you. So the average age was 29, okay? So this is a simple, right? We're all familiar with these sort of spreadsheet operations, right? We've, have we all tried to make a little formula like that before, right? Um, all right, so, um, and, and once you give names, you can even just say average of age, and it'll give you the average instead. That seems like a little more friendlier way to go, um, and thankfully get the same result. Um, there are various other things you can do in terms of you know, forming tables and so on. And I'm going to let you go through these um, on your own, make plots or do whatever. Um, what we're going to do, um, what we're going to do <coughs> instead, um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more next time about, um, about spreadsheets, but really what I'd like to have you do is, instead of using a spreadsheet, is start bringing into your tool set um, a legit programming language. A, le a legit sort of programming interface for looking at data. Um, and what, what you'll find is over time, and I guarantee you this after having taught 
oh, I'm so old now, um, that, uh, that you will come to a place where the things you want to do in an Excel spreadsheet, like you will hit a tool horizon. Your ideas don't fit inside the spreadsheet anymore. You want to do more, right? And not only do you want to do more, but there are things that you'll want to do that you can even do more simply within this programming language. So, um, and if you want to be a righteous investigative reporter, NICAR, for example, last year hosted um, a day-long workshop on this language that we're going to teach you. Um, and Pointer just had a beautiful uh, blog post about if you program, you could even be a better writer. Look at that. Um, all right, so the language that we're going to have you download for next time and play with next time is called R. It's open source. It's free. It runs on every single possible operating system you will have. Um, uh, I suppose if you have a Palm Pilot, it won't run on that, but um, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hedge my bets. Excuse me? Yeah, of course it runs on Solaris. And if you have a Solaris box, I will give you $5. Um, so, uh, uh, and, a, and a pat on the head because it seems sad. Um, so this is what you're going to download. Um, you're also going to download, so there's a little bit on here about what, what is R. Um, it's a little bit of a programming environment. You're going to dig it. Um, you'll also be downloading something called R Studio. Um, the word studio sounds sexy, right? <laughs> sort of programs that are named with just a single letter seems cool, and then putting studio next to it seems even cooler. Um, uh, uh, RStudio is an integrated development environment, an IDE. Basically what it means is that um, we will run R through RStudio. So you will double click on the RStudio icon, and, and this will pop up. Um, uh, it will look this way, whether you're using uh, a Mac, whether you're using a Linux laptop, whether you're using um, a, uh, uh, a, uh, 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 a Windows box, it'll look the same no matter what. So you sitting next to your neighbor can look at the same stuff and will behave the same. Right? Not every program can say that. Okay? Um, it also is good because you can hook it up to a version of R <coughs> running in the cloud. So if any of you take my computing class in the spring, we'll be doing all of our programming out on some machine somewhere else, but the interface is the same. So it doesn't matter where the computing is taking place, your interface will be the same. Okay? Um, the R Studio console has like a big data area up here that looks a lot like a spreadsheet. Um, it has a little thing up on the top right that tells you about all the objects that you've created and your programming will be about making objects. And then it has a an area for making plots and making graphics. Um, here what we did was type, there's a console on the bottom, um, the bottom left. Um, that has as its main feature this greater than sign. That greater than sign is called a prompt, and it is really R begging you to give it something to do. Please, oh please, I need another instruction. I want to play with data. I want to do more. Let me help you. Um, and here what we're doing is we're reading a CSV file, comma separated file from the stop and frisk data, just 500 units, and we're having a look at it. Okay. Um, over time, what you'll start to do, and I'll send around a little, a little exercise because we went over so late tonight, of how you, how you think about and start to, to program here. And what you'll find is that, um, uh, that um, oops, what you'll find is that um, the, uh, some of the things that we were doing, like to compute the, um, the, uh, the, the average age of people who were stopped, Instead of creating uh, a uh, highlighting a column and typing average of age, instead it's a simple expression in this language, and you just say mean of age. Right? So the effort to learn this versus a, a spreadsheet is the same. Right? Many of the constructs are the same, except this is going to take you the thousands of times farther. Right? So many of my friends at the Times, like Amanda Cox, who does those sort of amazing graphics, she starts her work in R and then hands the graphics over to the production side who will do it in Illustrator or something else. Okay? So R is becoming an important tool in, sort of in computational journalism practice. Um, it's fun to learn, and we will have some small assignments that will get us there. Okay? I've now taken 10 minutes of your time extra, and I'll give you 10 minutes back next time. Are there any questions before we break? All right, so you will download R and RStudio. Next time, bring your laptops, and we're going to start getting kinky with data.